All right, good morning, everybody. Um, the participants are all getting added in right now to the webinar. So let's just give it about 30 seconds or so until we start so the, the room can load up here. All right. All right, let's get started. Um, hello, Titans. We're back with another installment of Titan Table Talks today. My name is Philip Vasquez. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I serve as the Director of Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity Programs here at Cal State Fullerton. This dialogue is being brought to you by Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity Programs in partnership with the Office of the President, Alumni Engagement, and Government, Relation and, Government and Community Relations. Titan Table Talks are a monthly dialogue series in which panelists are invited to speak on their personal experiences as they relate to a selected theme. This year's theme is empowerment. This event will help educate participants on the impact of various social justice issues as they pertain to certain cultural identities with the goal of promoting racial equity and inclusion at Cal State Fullerton. Before we start, here are a few logistical details and tips to ensure you are able to engage in this dialogue. The first one is that this event is being broadcast on Zoom webinar. So your cameras and microphones will be off the entire time. Number two, if you would like to engage with our panel or team behind the scenes, please use the Q&A function in the menu bar below. Number three, the event is being recorded and will be uploaded to the DEEP YouTube channel with the closed captioning available as well. And then at the end of the dialogue, you'll receive an email with a feedback link to help us improve this program as well as provide ideas for future events. If and we also, I guess this time, we wanted to add another note here today. If you would like to share your name and your organization, your department, your major, or your community group in the Q&A portion of the Zoom webinar, we invite you to do so now. We wanted to do this to share introductions with participants to help foster community among our participants and panels in this online format. And all of you can see who has joined us and where they are from if you check that out on the Q&A tab. Today, our moderates and panelists will be engaging in a dialogue about Asian, Pacific Islander, and South Asian American empowerment. But first, I'd like to introduce Cal State Fullerton's president, Fram Vergie, for his opening remarks. Well, good morning, everybody. I guess it's still morning. Uh, good morning, Titan family, and welcome to Titan Table Talks, empowering Asian, Pacific Islander, and South Asian American communities. Uh, this is one of many events happening at Cal State Fullerton in honor of Asian Pacific Islander South Asian American Heritage Month. And as always, I'm proud and honored to be here and grateful, very grateful to the Titan community who made this event possible. Um, Cecil, Philip, Chloe, and the entire uh, DIEP team, our amazing moderator and my friend Jen Yi, and of course, our distinguished panelists. For those of you who know me, you know that my mission at Cal State Fullerton is to ensure that all Titans, every single one, feel welcome, included, and empowered. I've shared often about some of the Titans among us reporting to me that rather than feeling empowered on campus, they sometimes actually feel invisible. Since I arrived, I've made it my mission to work with campus leaders to create a more equitable and inclusive campus where all Titans feel both seen and welcomed and also valued and empowered to thrive. As part of that mission, when I see Titans empowering other Titans, I do my best to recognize that work. There are among us those who go the extra mile to ensure that students and faculty and staff feel cared for, employees feel valued, and that our faculty be, feel supported. In short, these are our, I don't know, our Titan superheroes, our Titan superheroes. Um, and as impressive as all of these Titan heroes are, every now and then I meet a Titan who becomes a personal superhero of mine. Someone who, in my eyes, exceeds even the most heroic among us. Titans who bring spirit and light, not just to our community and state, but to the nation and to the world. I've come to see these Titan superheroes as, well, um, as superheroes. They, they, they're, uh, they wield their great power with great responsibility. They seek their gifts, not for personal gain, but 
for uh, the greater good. And they understand that that the sweetness, the elixir of life is centered not in money or power or ego, but in honesty and love and service. To be to me that there's better no better example of that uh, during the pandemic than my good friend, my colleague, uh, my brother, uh, one of my personal Titan superheroes, Cam Nguyen. And that is especially true through the lens of what this Titan Table Talk is founded upon, empowerment. So I thought I would talk about Tam just a little bit as one Titan superhero uh, that we can all use as a, 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 a touchstone for what we do every day. Since Tam earned his Titan MBA in 2005, he served Titan, uh, the Titan family in Cal State Fullerton over and over again. He's the president. Uh, he was the president of the Cal State Fullerton Alumni Association. He's the founding president of the Vietnamese American MBA alumni chapter at Cal State Fullerton. He's a visiting professor at our School of Business. He's also an active leader in the Vietnamese Chamber of Commerce, uh, a vice cha uh, chair of the Orange County United Way Board of Directors, and he's gonna be the chair uh, in the coming year. And right now, Tam is also chair of our uh, Cal State Fullerton Philanthropic Board, Board of Governors. Tam is a first generation college student, just like me, an immigrant to this country, just like me. And his life story, it epitomizes the American dream from being separated from his father, a South Vietnamese Naval commander during the Vietnam War, to reuniting with his family in the United States, to earning his Titan degree, and then creating one of the largest beauty colleges in the nation with his sister and two-time Titan alum, Lin Nguyen, who is also amazing. But like so many other Asian families who've come to this country seeking a new life, Tam's mom and dad did not risk everything to merely transform their own lives and family legacies. They have sought always to transform their new home, their new country, their new community, to make this country a better place by fighting for social justice in our communities, by enriching our state with multicultural traditions and perspectives, by providing uh, immigrants with equitable access to skills and certifications that they would need to succeed as manicurists and estheticians, sure, but also as business owners, of voters, of community leaders, of social justice champions, of servant leaders in our community. In other words, empowerment, empowerment at, at its finest. That is what Tam and Lynn and their family have done since they arrived here as the war, as war refugees in the spring of 1975. And that's what they continue to do. Tam is a vital part of his community, a mentor to many and an active member in the Titan community. And to be honest, I'm not really sure when this guy sleeps. He is the first to volunteer and always looking a way for a way to help others. He is truly a real life Titan superhero. During the pandemic, Tam and his sister Lynn and, uh, and co-founders Christine Nguyen and uh, Ha Dong and Johnny No and Ted Nguyen, they created something called Nailing It for America. And in a few short months, this action-oriented organization purchased, collected, and delivered more than $30 million worth of PPE to frontline healthcare workers. On top of that, they paid for and delivered more than 70,000 restaurant meals for healthcare workers around the nation while they served on the front lines. Pam's mom, Kin, was right there with them, donating money from her own retirement savings to help get PPE and meals to the front lines. In other words, as the pandemic shut down Tam's business, and it caused untold financial losses for him. Instead of hunkering down and being worried about that, he and his family sought not to save themselves, but to save others. They felt empowered to do good. As the word spread about what he and Nailing for It for America's co-founders were doing, I really looked forward to seeing the nation praise their efforts. I look forward to Orange County thanking them for their leadership and their benevolence. I look forward to watching their fellow Americans hold them up as the superheroes there are. they are. And while that gratitude flooded in from within our Titan family, what was really disturbing is the opposite was, was true elf, elsewhere in our nation. Their hard work uh, didn't shield them from the hate that would come. 
And as we are all painfully aware, this is not new in American history. <clears throat> Excuse me, Asians and Asian Americans have long served and supported our nation while concurrently being scapegoated, called out for hate, discriminated against. Peace of communities helped to build this country. Not only that, but then they were barred from citizenship uh, within the US. Policies like the Chinese Exclusion Act were put in place. A piece of military members fought for this nation in the First World War only to be forced into internment camps during the second. A piece of business owners poured their love into America only to endure revenge motivated attacks in the wake of 9-11. Now we all know our nation's shameful history. We could be proud to be Americans, but it's important to recognize it and that it's not just our history, it's also in our present if we don't stand up if we're not empowered to be our, uh, a strong voice and build a better future. Not on the other side of the world, not somewhere else in this country, not in some other part of our state, but right here. It happens right here to our colleagues, to our friends, and yes, even to our beloved Titans. So as we talk about empowerment today, I wanted to use Tam as an example, but there are so many other Tams in the Titan family, in the Orange County community, and across our country. We must consider the landscape that our, a piece of Titans are navigating on and off of our campus. As a nation, we've been fully awakened and reminded of the anti-Asian hate that has plagued our society, from scapegoating and blatant racism to inequitable access to housing and healthcare and jobs. All this on top of the day-to-day -day adversity that our Apisa communities face as they navigate the systems that have created this model minority myth ideology while treating Asian communities as a monolith, at somehow just one collection of people and in so doing further oppressing them. So with all this in mind, as we celebrate, as we should, and we point to the success of our students and alumni, as we should, like our panelists today, the uh, amazing Apisa Titans like Tam and Lynn, um, and, and, and those panelists who you'll be hearing from today that make their mission to empower those in our community and talk about the connection the connection between empowerment and resilience. We have to remember these simple truths. The trait of empowerment should not be needed to link, be linked to resilience and resilience should not be a prerequisite to succeed, to succeed at Cal State Fullerton, to succeed in our, in our community or in our nation. Our APISA students should not have to point out that the idea of the model minority is a myth or that the Asian community is not a monolith. It's a beautiful tapestry of different cultures and different peoples who come together just as the rest of our community does. Instead, we have to continuously do more, do more to eradicate these myths and these systems of oppression. We have to enhance equity for all Titans so that resilience is a choice for our students, not some kind of mandatory survival tactic. So we can be confident that we are aiming to do just that at Cal State Fullerton. It is a cornerstone of who we are, diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, our, our guiding principles for social justice. And while we continuously focus on this movement toward change, and we feel like we're headed in the right direction, and I know where we are, and we're making progress, and I know that we are, we also know there's still so much more work to do to reach the day when all Titans, in our APISA community and in all our communities, see themselves in our educators, find themselves in our programs, recognize their cultures and their histories in our curriculum, no longer have to battle hate in their communities, and believe in themselves and the actualization of their hopes and their dreams. That day comes when our APISA Titans are no longer seen as a monolith, when all myths are busted and all Titans are seen and appreciated for the value and the richness that they bring as individuals to our campus. When empowerment is not attached to oppression or marginalization, but to all of us, and when Titan superheroes like Tam and Lynn and like our panel members today and like Jen Yi, who's moderating, are applauded for empowering others. I remain confident that together we can get there. 
I'm honored to do this work with you, to share this journey, and once again, celebrate Asian Pacific Islander South Asian American History Month with all of you. I wanna thank you all again for joining us in this journey, for joining us today, and for each of you, each of you being real life Titan superheroes. Thank you. Philip, you wanna take it from here? Yes, thank you, President Fergie. Uh, appreciate your remarks today and thank you for being here. Um, I also wanted to just send a little bit of a reminder to everybody um, that we uh, have opened up the Q&A for everybody to do introductions, but just also to remind everybody that throughout the dialogue today, you're more than welcome to um, send uh, questions uh, that you um, that come up for you and that at the end of the dialogue today, our moderator and panelists will go ahead and do their best to answer as many of those questions as, as needed. <clears throat> Pardon me. So without further ado, um, what we'll do is I'm going to introduce our moderator, moderator today, Professor Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Yi, who will take it over and have um, introductory remarks and reintroduce the panelists for this afternoon's dialogue. Professor Yi. Go ahead and unmute Professor Yi, thank you. And the rest of the panelists can also, um, once you're done speaking, they can um, turn their camera on to join the group too. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your remarks, President Virgie. Uh, they're so warm and timely, and especially for choosing a theme this year for our Titan Table Talks that is very close to my heart. When Dr. Vasquez invited me to moderate, he also invited me to share just a few thoughts about empowerment to set the context for our conversation. And I'll do a little bit of that before turning to our esteemed panelists to share their insights and their stories. President Virgie did a wonderful job of being able to address many of the issues that we see and experience in our APISA communities. And for me, empowerment means many things. And today I'll just focus on the idea of empowerment as belonging, as courage, and as imagination. To me, empowerment in our uh, piece of communities is all about belonging, belonging in both of our families and cultures of our heritage and in our communities and our ever-changing tapestry of American society. Too often, we're asked, where are you from? No, where are you really from? And this question, while perhaps seeming like a friendly seed to start this conversation, can often seem to imply that we are being asked because of how we look, and we must have come from somewhere else, and that we actually don't belong. As a professor of Asian American studies, I teach about many of the issues and historical events and tragedies and oppressions that President Virgie just mentioned, the history of legislation, violence, and racism in our country, the very sad and terrible stories of entire neighborhoods being burned down, lynchings, laws like the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Geary Act, the Immigration Act of 1924 that prevented or limited immigration, the annexation of Hawaii and the imprisonment of Queen Liliuokalani in her own palace in 1893, the forcible internment of more than 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II, the murder of Vincent Chin in 1982 and other hate crimes that impact our Filipinx, Sikh, Korean, Vietnamese, Cambodian, Lao, and many other communities. We mourn the terrible shootings and violence in Atlanta, Indianapolis, and Monterey Park. The language that is used to vilify and accuse members of our community as foreigners, enemies, and spies, and imply that we do not belong. When in fact, we do belong. We discuss in our classes how we belong in our communities, our society, and our country, because of our courage and the courage of those who came before us. President Virgie mentioned uh, that many of us have family members who have uh, countries of origin in other locations, in Asia, in Polynesia, in Oceania, in South Asia. And whether our ancestors immigrated to North America in the in 17 or 1800s or in the last decade, someone in our families had the courage to decide that we needed to move to a place that offered safety, that offered safety, security, and opportunity. War, economic and political strife, starvation, colonization. Someone in our families decided to send family members to a place where there is the possibility of being who we are, enriching our society 
and uplifting one another. And that took a tremendous amount of courage. But in order to become uh, who we are fully in our society also requires imagination. Imagination to stretch ourselves beyond what people can see now and what people can imagine for our futures. In order for all of our communities to come together, we need to imagine ways to connect with each other in all of our diverse communities um, because what we need to do is to create spaces like this one to share our stories and open our minds and hearts to the possibilities. Those who have come before me in Asian American studies imagine the existence of this field and discipline of study so that we can teach ourselves about and serve our communities and empower ourselves by creating and sharing knowledge. And I'm so grateful to be at Cal State Fullerton to do this wonderful work with my colleagues in Asian American Studies, in the Asian American Pacific Islander Faculty Staff Association, with our Asian Pacific American Resource Center, and obviously all of the people associated with this organization and with the President's Office. It's with great pleasure now that I'd like to introduce our panelists to start our conversation. I'd like to invite each of you to turn on your cameras and I will give a brief introduction and then we can start our conversation. First, I would like to introduce our uh, first panelist who's uh, Tammy Kim. Tammy is a mother, nonprofit leader, educator, community advocate, and small business owner, and a former corporate executive who has lived, worked, and raised her son in Orange County for the past two decades. She was elected to the Irvine City Council in November of 2020 in a historic win, beating out 13 other candidates to take first place. She won her seat with more than 43,700 votes, the highest vote count for any city council candidate in the city's history. Born in Korea, Tammy's family immigrated to America as an infant and went on to a successful career as a business executive in Fortune 500 and venture-backed technology startups, um, resolving highly successful business and management issues, managing multinational teams. Tammy is a well-respected and community leader who has served as chair of the Language Access Committee for the Orange County Registrar of Voters, Orange County Complete Count Com Committee for the 2020 Census, and on the steering committee for the Irvine Global Village Festival. She's currently on the boards of the Southern California Association of Governments, Orange County Council of Governments, Irvine Community Land Trust, and so many more. Tammy, we welcome you to this conversation. Kathy, Kathy Yu is joining us. Kathy Ting Ting Yu is a first generation Chinese American who grew up in San Gabriel Valley a predominantly Asian and Hispanic community in Los Angeles County. She graduated from Cal State Fullerton in 2010 with a BS in political science and communications. She was actively involved as a student leader, including serving in ASI and a member of Sigma Kappa Sorority. She currently serves on the board of Cal State Fullerton's Alumni Association and sits on the scholarship interview committee. After graduating from Cal State Fullerton, she moved to the Bay Area and spent 10 years working in media and advertising at companies such as Hulu and TikTok. During the pandemic, she decided to pursue a career pivot into corporate social responsibility, and she, made, she obtained her MS in organizational leadership with a concentration in social impact from Northeastern University. She now works at Pixar Animation Studios on the inclusion and outreach team. Her role at Pixar focuses on philanthropy and community outreach, supporting an inclusive culture of belonging and providing access to diverse storytellers. She's based in San Francisco and is a proud auntie to three nephews, a niece, and two very rambunctious dogs. Malo Sajio Jr., we'd like to invite you into the conversation. Hi, Malo. Malo is a native Hawaiian and a Samoan, excuse me, Malo is of native, native Hawaiian and Samoan descent. His identity comprises that which gives him great strength and pride, but can also remind him of the struggles and the trauma experienced by his indigenous ancestors. After graduating from high school, Malo enlisted in the United States Navy from 2004 to 2008. After completing his service, he struggled to acclimate and transition from service to civilian life. He, founded the, he found the support he needed at Cypress College's Veterans Resource Center, where he has welcomed and surrounded by peers who shared his same experiences. 
This is where he found his passion for serving transitioning service members with their educational aspirations. He later earned his Bachelor of Arts in Human Services from Cal State Fullerton and received his Master of Social Work from University of Southern California. In his previous roles, he served as director of the Veteran Services Center at both Irvine Valley College and Cerritos College. He also found that working in a higher education setting allowed him to support his API community. By being a strong leader in the veteran community, he's able to extend his impact to local API leaders. Welcome. I am so pleased to be able to start our conversation today with some questions. What we'd like to do is ensure that if anybody has questions throughout this Titan Table Talk, if you could kindly place them into the Q&A and we'll reserve time at the end of this session to be able to answer them. All right, I'd like to get started. Thank you all, uh, Malo, Tammy, and Kathy for joining us today. I'd like to start with a question of, can you tell us why you chose to accept the invitation to speak on this panel? And why does empowering a piece of communities matter to you? And you can start in any order. Um, I'm happy to start. Yes, please. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you so much for inviting me here today. So, uh, you know, the reason I accepted um, this invitation to speak on this panel because empowering the peace of community is something that has uh, been near and dear to my heart uh, for for many many years. Uh, you know, historically, our community really has been a subject of discrimination, marginalization, and underrepresentation in so many aspects of our society, including uh, politics, media, um, and even education. And by empowering our community and having platforms and spaces, spaces such as these, we can really address these issues uh, by providing support and resources towards uh, making a more equitable and just society for our community. So um, that's why this is important and why I'm here today. Thank you so much. I can go next. Um, the reason why I accepted, uh, being other than being a, a proud Titan alum, I absolutely love this university. It's uh, it's provided me with such great opportunities that go beyond just the just the campus. But it's also been it's it's my greatest privilege to to just also represent um, our API community. Um, I might I obviously I identify as Polynesian. Uh, I'm Hawaiian and, and so on. And it wasn't until way later in my adulthood that I understood what API really was. Like I'd never really identified myself as Asian and um, being able to kind of not just accept it, but understand it has really opened up my eyes to like what it truly means to be part of the API community and really trying to empower and entrust future generations with what it means to be a part of this, 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 this beautiful community. Um, so yeah, I, I was very excited, very happy, very uh, privileged to be a part of this. And I look forward to the, to the rest of the session. <laughs> We're so pleased you're with us and thank you for your enthusiasm. Kathy? Yes, and um, I just want to echo everything that they both said, but um, echoing Mallow, I'm also a proud Titan alum, and so I just want to do what I can to empower our communities at Kelsey Fullerton, um, so I'm just really excited to be here, um, and just in general, empowering our community is important to me because, you know, we've always been known to be the ones that just never speak up for ourselves, um, and as President Virgie mentioned, you know, we sometimes feel invisible, um, and, you know, I just believe we deserve to speak our truth and be proud of who we are just as much as every other culture. Um, and we deserve to be more in the spotlight. You know, we need more representation um, in leadership and in Hollywood, as Tammy mentioned, um, and not be seen as a monolith. Um, so, you know, I, I come from an entertainment background. So now that we're starting to see a little bit more representation in film, um, it just makes me so hopeful for the future. And I want to kind of continue that momentum. So that's why I'm here. That's wonderful. Thank you again for joining us. We've got quite a group here, and I think that my next question is really important, and I'd love to ask it in the context in which each of you operates, because you're all operating in really interesting spheres. So how would you define empowerment 
And what does that look like in each of the areas in which you have impact? Um, I, I can start. I, you know, when I think about empowerment, uh, especially within the uh, PISA uh, community, I really think about it in multiple lenses. First of all, it's really about improving the lives and of of those in our community and those uh, surrounding our community. I think it's um, making sure that community members can take control of our own lives and advocate for ourselves and providing uh, a voice and making sure that they know how to use their voice. So in the political realm, it would be making sure that, um, that our government is accessible, that our government uh, can reach out to those who are linguistically isolated, who may uh, need uh, further uh, interpretation skills, making sure that they know that they can come to public comments and speak in their language and we have, uh, or they can provide a translator and that that translator won't eat into their public comment time and making sure I had to educate even our own um, council on that, even our city attorney to figure out that when you have three minutes to speak, you and your trans interpreter have, so you have a total of six minutes in order to be able to, to speak. And, uh, and to me, that's part of empowerment is providing and helping others find their voice. That's really powerful. And to be able to create the space for that to happen and um, just informing those three minutes make all the difference. Wow. That's incredible. Thank you. Malo or Kathy, you want to? Yeah, um, yeah, kind of echoing with, uh, is it Miss Kim? I'm sorry, I don't know how to refer to you. <laughs> I apologize. Um, but also, uh, when it comes to empowering the way I, I kind of see, especially in my sphere, in my area of, of expertise, when it works with uh, the veteran and military community, is understanding who you are, like giving strength to your identity and um, uh, being present with it. I know a lot, uh, what a, uh, a big stereotype or a big stigma that really surrounds not just the veteran community, but also API, I believe, is the stigma behind mental health. And uh, mental health isn't something that's going to go away anytime soon. It's something that not only do we need to embrace as a community, but also just understand that it's not weakness, that it, it's it's also a strength to, to kind of be present within and be open about it, to talk about it. Um, there's been so much negative connotations with it when it came to the API community, as well as the veteran community and military community that um, I feel like being able to be comfortable with your identity, also identifying not only your strengths, but your weaknesses to empower your ability to grow and to heal is something that I feel if we just connected more with our API heritage that we can find those modalities of, of strengthening who we are, not just as, a, as an individual, but as a community. That's incredibly powerful. And even naming uh, issues and uh, things that most people say, gosh, you know, we shouldn't talk about in different families. Uh, mental health is such an extraordinarily important, important issue. And as I often share with my students, you can have somebody break an arm and you would go to a doctor and get a cast. If you oh. have experienced trauma, you would go to a professional and seek um, professional uh, treatment. Did you want to add anything more? Yeah, um, it just we're such a strong family oriented type of community, not saying that we're it's we're unique in that sense. But we are, I believe that's one of our strengths as a community is that we are just so ingrained with our families and where we come from, because a lot of us are very our first generation, which I am. I am first generation here in, in this country. My mother and my father migrated here from the Samoan Islands and in Hawaii. It was a state, but technically I am first generated because <laughs> my mother uh, it turned to a state when she was a small child. So um, I think uh, if we were to just understand where we come from, I think it would go a long way in helping us to kind of heal and understand each other. Wow, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, my turn. <laughs> um, that was so beautiful. You said both of you. So thank you so much for that. Um, um, and I feel like I'm probably going to be repeating a lot of what you both said too, but just like for my definition of empowerment, you know, I 
define it as, you know, the act of giving or enabling the, the power, right, or authority to do something, um, and when possible, providing resources to do so. And resources to me is like the bigger part of empowerment. Um, and in my current role at Pixar, I work with employee resource groups, or ERGs is what we call them. And um, these are driven by employees, you know, coming together based on their identities or interests, um, and they provide safe spaces for our communities to share their experiences. Um, and in addition to finding community, these groups also educate our studio. Um, so they plan events to celebrate heritage months. Um, so it could be, you know, having Asian dishes in our studio cafe for lunch or showcasing screenings from Asian filmmakers um, or planning fundraising and volunteer events that, you know, support our local community. Um, and our ERGs are also um, involved with the filmmaking process to ensure that, you know, our films are authentic to our cultures. Um, and this is all really um, possible because of our executives and the fact that they're all aligned with the mission to ensure that our communities um, feel safe and feel heard and feel empowered to share their stories. Um, so just knowing that like um, our executives are on our side um, to showcase our cultures is a really big part of um, empowerment. That's exciting. And I appreciate your pointing out the need to have resources to accompany the commitment, because if there's not the resources, and as Tammy pointed out, the infrastructure and the structural change, then you know, highlighting and uplifting doesn't always go a long way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, I would love to be able to turn to a little more of a personal question, which is asking you about um, naming a person or maybe an incident in your life or maybe an incident in history that has shaped your thoughts and feelings about empowerment. What brought you to where you are today? Uh, because it's just incredibly inspiring. Um. You know, I think a lot of it for me personally has a lot to do with just my own family and, uh, you know, seeing the just juxtaposition of, you know, what it means to be an American and the strength and courage um, of, of being in a democratic society means, but then seeing my own family um really feeling not empowered or their own lack of empowerment and being able to use their own voice to shape their own destiny here in this country um and the the feeling of you know constant gratitude of not being able to um to complain or express any dissatisfaction and you know uh, in, in seeing that is very, um, you know, you're, you're kind of seeing these two mixed messages in, in many ways. Um, you know, we're supposed to be able to yours, use our voice. And, you know, I was very uh, active, you know, when I was in college in like anti-war movements, for example, <laughs> uh, you know, without aging myself. And, you know, or, um, you know, writing on behalf of Amnesty International to talk about, you know, human rights violations that are happening around the world. And, you know, that is part of being an American. But feeling because we should be grateful to be in this country means we need to be silent. And so that's where, um, you know, it's, it was working through and seeing that juxta, just juxtaposition and, you know, being able to sort of, or understanding like, how do you thread that needle or why should we thread that needle? Or why, why is it that I have to behave a certain way, but, but a European uh, American <laughs> is allowed to express themselves in the fullest, fullest manner possible, but, but we can't. And, and so, that's really where I I uh, started to really question, um, you know, what that really meant, and it and has spent, you know, I've spent almost a lifetime, um, sort of exploring that, if you will, and and questioning that, and and we'll probably, you know, uh, as we go along here, start to sort of unravel some of that. But that was really. Um, when I really began to sort of think about it in the in the context of empowerment. 
Okay, I just have goosebumps listening to you talk here. <laughs> and I think that um, my one, the interest in civic engagement and and community engagement is so critical for that very reason, that thought process of why the difference uh, for multiple communities and what does that mean to be silenced, um, even though you are also told you're a citizen and a member. Um, so thank you, thank you so much. Um, Mom or Kif, Kathy? Yeah, Kathy, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to jump in because, you know, Tammy, what you said really resonated with me, um, you know, as if our community should be just grateful that we're here and not complain. And I, I felt like, wow, that was <laughs> so powerful. Um, and um, similar to that, you know, I feel like what was, you know, I think the pandemic actually really influenced me and shaped my current thoughts and feelings about empowerment. Um, you know, I kept thinking that what was going on before was totally fine. And then I think it was like the pandemic that really pushed me to think about, um, think more. And, you know, I live in San Francisco and during the peak of the pandemic, there were several incidents of physical violence and attacks against Asian elders. Um, and there were stories about, you know, Asian elders getting um, attacked while they're walking down the street or waiting for the bus. Um, and it was just like heartbreaking to hear about, you know, just these little Asian grandmas and grandpas who don't have the ability to fight back and defend themselves. And um, it's like, now they're kind of like, you know, I know mental health issues may have played a part in the attacks, but I couldn't help but feel that there was some racial hate and anger, you know, um, for blaming Asians during COVID. Um, but I think that, you know, what was going on before, you know, me just kind of like putting my head down and ignoring everything, like it's not working anymore. We need to do more. And I, I think that that really, um, inspired me to really push further and, um, and it just made me feel like, you know, we can't just blend in anymore and be silent. We need to stick up for ourselves and, and do more. So. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Kathy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm in awe as, as well. I'm like getting a little giddy. I'm getting a little. <laughs> I really love what these two ladies that uh, uh, kind of where they stirred this this conversation. Um, but can I get a, a little slight reminder, uh, Professor Yee, of the question? It was something. To do, it was somebody who inspired you, or sure, anybody? sure, yes, and absolutely. And feel free to call me Jen. You know, uh, because we're just having a conversation here. Uh, so the question I have is, you know, can you name a person or maybe an incident in your life or maybe an incident in history that yeah. shaped your thoughts and feelings about empowerment? Got it. So for me, uh, it's my mother. My mother is the person who uh, it, it was more because of a recent incident uh, regarding Mauna Kea on the, on, on the Big Island. Um, yeah, that's something my family is very... It, I was raised more around my, my Samoan heritage, not so much my Hawaiian heritage. And my mother, she never really, she, you know, she, she spoke about, you know, we, we were very proud to be Islanders, you know, native Hawaiian, native, native, native Samoan and everything like that. But my mom, I never really heard my mom speak about it until what happened with Mauna Kea. And to go into that whole story, it's just, it's very deep and very traumatic, but just to kind of give you the brass text of it, 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 it was a sacred burial, like a sacred, a burial ground slash place of worship for the Hawaiian people. And my, like I said before, my mother was small enough to understand how it was like the, like the cultural genocide that existed with the, the people, the native Hawaiians, how they were prevented from practicing their, 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 their religions, pra uh, uh, restricted from practicing their culture, like their dance, their, their music, their language. And for my mother to just all of a sudden start you know, under like sharing these stories with us, it was not just, it, it was, it, unfortunately it was a bad situation, but it also helped me to understand more of where my mother came from. And it helped me to, to engage more with that side of my culture. And um, like when you, when you talk about empowerment, you know, I think my mother just helped to empower myself and my eight sisters and my other two brothers. So I have a very big family. So when you talk about empowering, like I feel like a parent's role, not just to you know protect and to, to watch your children grow and to become something great, like other than yourself, but to help lead these, these conversations of empowerment and like helping us to understand where we come from and, and to be proud of who we are and, and, uh, and how the journey isn't just starting, it's 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 just the beginning and how we have so much more to, to build off of and, and to grow from. So yeah, I would have to say my mother and and the uh, incident that happened with uh, Mauna Kea. 
Oh my gosh, that is so incredibly powerful to hear because I think that, you know, I only learned about the Mauna Kea uh, issue uh, a few years ago when I went to a conference. And then when I saw the elders or the kapuna put their lives and their bodies on the line to make sure that the aina or the land was protected, you know, and to be able to share with our students what the issue is and, and to say, you know, this is more than being about land. It's about understanding that the land is uh, perceived to be what feeds you what nourishes you. And so just as that is how you see the land, then uh, the land also requires protection, right? That's just incredibly powerful. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you for bringing up that, that really important, important uh, issue in our communities. I want to be able to uh, move in a direction of thinking about, um, and I'm gonna skip maybe a couple of questions here, uh, in terms of empowering ourselves, you know, one of the definitions that Kathy mentioned, you know, in terms of empowerment, what it means to you is, you know, the idea of somebody granting you some authority, right? And I have a question here about, um, you know, yes, de the definition of, excuse me, of empowerment is uh, being granted authority by someone else. And that's what you look up when you see it on the dictionary. Um, but in this, for example, when we are young, we're empowered by our parents to make decisions. So that source of power comes from outside of us. Uh, yet there comes a time in our lives when we kind of shift this source of power from outside of ourselves to other sources. And so I want to ask you, what do you believe is or are your sources of power? And how would you recommend that someone tap into their sources of power? Um, so I, I kind of have some thoughts around this. Um, because I believe with empowerment, especially around a PISA empowerment, no one will ever grant us authority, ever, ever. We have to take it and we have to find it within ourselves to grab hold of what we are owed and what we, what is rightfully ours. Um, and so that's that's sort of the premise in which I work off of. Um, so uh, because if we have to wait for anything to be given, it will never be given to us. And we have to take it. And I don't mean steal it because it is rightfully ours. Uh, and we have to, what we have to be given is and what we have to impart on the next generation is to give them a voice and give them almost permission to take what is theirs. I have to teach my son every single day that they need to, that he needs to work twice as hard because uh, to be honest, a white man never has to ask for permission. And that is we need to just find our inner strength and inner voice to be able to, to own what is ours and not wait for it to be given to us. Because we'll be waiting an awfully long time if that needs to happen. Um, I have other thoughts around it, but that's, that's <laughs> what I heard, like granted authority. I was like, no, that will never happen. We'll be waiting a long time. Yeah, I, I appreciate your answering the question in this way because that definition troubled me when I looked it up, right? And I thought, okay, if the theme is empowerment, that's very troubling, right? To make that assumption that that's where we're coming from. And can can you just explain a little bit more what you mean when you say that um, that this is something that's ours? What does that mean? This is something that's ours as though it is anyone else's. It is empowerment and having the tools and the confidence um, should be what is like embedded in us. And that's what I mean, it's ours. It is ours by right. It is ours by birth. 
It is not anything that we need to wait for. And that's what I mean about being ours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy, Malo, how would you like to? I don't want to follow that. So I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> Go ahead, Malo. <laughs> no, um, as far as empowerment and, uh, and uh, it coming from, from that place, I would say be aware of your privileges. Um, I'm speaking to two, three incredibly strong women just based off of what I've seen and what I've heard so far. Um, but me being a man, you know, like I may not be a Caucasian white male, but I am a man. And with that in itself comes a lot of privileges. And um, so when I answer this question, I'm coming from a little more of a humble side uh, of answering this question. Um, understanding your privileges and understanding what opportunities await you without even really having to try. I feel like you need to be a little more um, gracious and, and humble when it comes to like, uh, like, you know, accepting a lot of these things that naturally will come your way. Um, I'm a very masculine man, but I'm also a very, very soft, gentle man. I think that's something that just runs in my family and runs in my culture. Um, uh, we respect our women with the highest esteem, um, as being, being of, of, of someone heritage and also being of Hawaiian heritage. Like our, the women in our family, they tell the stories, you know, the men may be all grumpy and growly and, you know, may say what needs to get done. But at the end of the day, you know, it's the women in our family. It's my grandmother, it's my mother, it's my aunts, you know, it's my aunties, my, my, uh, my family who, um, all the women in my family who are going to carry on all the legacies of our family and what we did, our traditions, our morals, our ethics, all that stuff like that, because that's just who they are. Like, you know, they're nurturers. They, 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 hold, they hold our family down, they ground us. Um, so that would be my advice to the next generation is just to humble yourself. Um, this, uh, Tammy already spoke about being advocates on your own, you know, you know take what's yours kind of thing, um, but, for the men in this conversation, like humble yourself, you know, like allow yourself to be vulnerable um, and things may not always come easily, but it's worth working for. Also a very, very powerful contribution. And I appreciate how you have brought in this notion of our intersecting identities, right? Understanding the role of gender, um, also understanding a role of um, being cis heterosexual. You know, we haven't even talked about the, the spectrum of multiple uh, gendered identities. And so I, I really appreciate your bringing this into the conversation. Thank you. Wow, I don't know how to follow up with those two. <laughs> um, I feel like my my answer may be a little bit more simpler and maybe boring compared to them. <laughs> but um, you know, for me, my my sources of power are um, the people I surround myself with. I I try to surround myself with people who are smarter than me, people who are diverse, people who um, you know are positive and open minded because they help me see different perspectives and help me feel um, like I can kind of understand, um, you know, what is going on, but also helps me feel like, okay, um, I, I know who I am and I know who they are and I have a better understanding of like how we can all coexist in this society together. So I just think that I would recommend to people to think about who you surround yourself with um, and think about like how they can uplift you if they're not, if they're bringing you down or if they're, um, closed-minded and not um, thinking with a diverse perspective that they're, it's not going to help you at all. So very simple answer. <laughs> so, you know, I find, I find that even though it seems like a simple answer, your answer is actually quite complex because it speaks to the importance of making sure that you question who you're surrounding yourself with. Are you surrounding yourself with people who only think like you? or who only have your perspective, or, or are you being intentional about making sure that you surround yourself with people who can keep your mind open, your heart open, right? Uh, I think that's a really important point. Malo, yeah, I just wanna ask, well, yeah, like it may sound simple, but I don't know how many times I've surrounded myself with toxic people, like people who are just, 
you know, they just bring you down. They bring the energy down in the room. They're all tied up into their own drama and stuff like that, which is rightfully their own, you know, good for them to, you know, deal with their problems. But um, it's so often do our ener- does our energy kind of like a lot of our energy derives from other people that we surround ourselves with. And if you don't pay attention to that, how easily your energy can just get diminished and drop and fall because you're not surrounding yourself with the right people. Thank you. You know, I, I really appreciate, oh, did you want to respond, Kathy? No, I'm good. That was great. Good. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, I appreciate talking about sources of power because sometimes people will look at themselves and say they don't have any power. And, and I, this is such an important conversation. Uh, you know, often in our APISA communities, uh, some individuals refer to their families, like you did, Malo, or their communities as their motivation and or source of power. Uh, can you also speak to if this is true for you? And if so, how is that true for you? Oh, it, it's 100% who I am. I'm a very extroverted person. That's not so much of a term that's PISFA very much, but I think it's just overall, that's who I am. I'm a very uh, outgoing person and my energy just derives from everybody. But as far as my culture, my heritage, my, my family, uh, my, my, my religion, my faith, everything derives from that. And I feel um, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's something that I, I hold very dear to who I am. Um, my mother, my, my mother was a practicing Mormon and my father was a practicing Protestant. My mother gave up her not necessarily, didn't give up her religion, but went, uh, took on the, the, the Protestant faith uh, out of respect for my father and his family. My mother was a little distant from her family, but um, as far as my culture, everything we do derives around the family, around, and we respect our elders. I know that's not just true for mine. I know that's probably true for every other Episcopal uh, community here, Asian Pacific Islander community. We just respect our elders with such high esteem because you know what, they've experienced life and they gave us life. So um, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> I'm very in tune with everything that who I am derives from that, so. Thank you, thank you. Kathy or Tammy? Well, um, I, you know, again, just going back, you know, family obviously is important. Um, you know, so as, as important as my parents have been in terms of, uh, shaping shaping a lot of the decisions that I make for at least from a policy perspective because what I do is I, I put myself in their shoes in understanding how difficult it it's been for them to be able to navigate through this country and navigate through resources and just knowing what's out there um you know, the fact that they have to consume their news in, in language or the fact that they have to, um, uh, you know, they, they need a, a lot more support in terms of uh, being able to read complex documents in English. Um, so I, I always see things from their perspective, but then on the flip side, also looking at things from my son's perspective in terms of what do I want the world to be for him? And, and doing what I can to carve that out. Um, you know, Kathy, you are now in an ERG group in a, in a major company at Pixar. And, you know, having worked in corporate myself, and at that time, I was the only, not only female in the room, but a person of color, let alone Asian American. And knowing that we get hired in droves now, we graduate from college, we get hired, but then there's a bamboo ceiling and that bamboo ceiling clearly exists still to this day. And making sure that um, that he knows how to break through the bamboo ceiling. And when we talk about, um, uh, you know, Malo being a male, but still in this country, 
it's still even as an Asian American male, it's still hard because you've got the glass ceiling for women, but you got that bamboo ceiling that still exists and it's working towards that. So I think about the past and I think about my parents, but I think through my son, I think about the future and then what I can do now through either policy um, or uh, being a role model or being a voice on, on how I can bridge those barriers you know, in the future. What a beautiful answer, Tammy. Thank you so much for bringing us together in terms of thinking of both our elders as well as our future and then what we absolutely can do in the present because really that present is all we've got, right? So thank you. Kathy. Uh, I don't know if I have a, a separate answer from kind of what I, I discussed earlier about, you know, my um, who I surround myself with, um, but ultimately, you know, my family, has been a huge motivation and my source of power as well, because they've shaped a lot of my identity um, and my ability to stand up for what I believe in. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that's been, I'm so grateful for that support. Um, so thank you. You know, we're getting close to the time when we need to start Q&A with, uh, with our audience. And I just wanted to ask you a last question and you can choose which aspect you answer of it. And it speaks to thinking about the future. So um, one, on one hand, in the past few years of the pandemic, we've really seen a rise in anti-Asian hate and racialized violence. Um, my question comes in two parts, which is you can speak to this or you can speak in generally for the community. What concrete action can people take who aren't who don't identify as being part of a, an Apisa community to counter this racism and violence? Or in general, what's one action step that today's participants can take to uplift and support and empower our Apisa communities, um, both now and maybe throughout the year? So your choice. Um, I'm going to take a stab at this um, because I I. I I do feel, um, you know, what can allies do, but what can we do? And, and I think it's a two prong. I, I, there's there's multiple answers to this because one of the things that we've with with anti Asian hate um, is that there's lots of different facets to it. There is. Uh, and I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I possibly can because it's super complex. But we have our own perpetual foreigner status that we have to deal with. And, and I think um, for those who are allies and who those who may not address, uh, um, you know, view themselves, um, you know, uh, as a piece, they also have to recognize what are they contributing um, and how are they contributing to us being viewed as perpetual foreigners. So I think that's number one. Um, I think another thing that we, that really hasn't been talked uh, much about on this particular panel, um, but that we need to address is uh, the the long history of racialized misogyny that has existed in our community, especially among our Pisa women. And um, as those who are outsiders, how are they contributing to the hypersexualization? and racialized misogyny, i.e. yellow fever, you know, and are they contributing to that? Um, and so these are some of the things that I think, um, you know, we can, we can think about and perhaps unpack, um, you know, as we go down the road. I just left off, <laughs> I don't need to cut it off here. <laughs> and I left some pretty, pretty big things, but, um, you know, but but I think these are these are real things that have to be thought through, uh, because without addressing these things, I I, I don't know, um, you know how we how we sort of move move on to the next reiteration of our 
of ourselves and our identity in this country. I think that's really critical what you've brought up because that hypersexualized um, misogyny towards uh, a piece of women, uh, the notion of the um, effeminate, a piece of male, uh, all of these controlling images are so damaging and yet are perpetuated. And so, as you say, in terms of our allies, uh, our allies in our multiple communities, both inside and outside of a piece of communities, uh, can really ask the question of what do you do to contribute to that? So um, thank you for bringing, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. one last point uh, within our own, within ourselves and with our own communities, when we look internal, we have to also understand how we're working and communicating with other communities of color. Yes. And I think that is critical and that's the part we have to keep reinforcing because you know this, none of this operates in a vacuum. And when we are not working hand in hand with other communities of color, um, we, you know we're all on this boat together. So we either you know we either float and rise up together, or we or we you know fall flat together. We sink together. We we swim together. So. That's that's the internal facing thing that I I, I do want to bring up. So I love it. I, we could talk for hours here. Yeah, we could talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> like my, yeah, go ahead. My, my only contribution was going to be like, don't be hypocritical. Like what uh, what Tammy was just talking about, like how uh, stereotypes, things that feed into they just feed into the hate and the 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 the, the, the just the constant circling of hypersexual the hyper uh, sexual. Um, uh, mistreatment of Asian women and everything like that. Um, don't don't feed into it. Don't don't um, don't like how all Asian drivers are bad or whatever, whatever it may be. Like don't carry on that those stereotypes or those negative those negative thinking towards other cultures. You know, like hatred isn't something. It's not prejudice. It's not. It doesn't see color. It doesn't see anything like that. It it only gives. It only it's only powered by your own your own uh, insecurities and your own thoughts. So if you're going to be if you're going to be hateful towards another group, don't expect other groups not to be hateful towards you. Um, you have to be, you know, you have to be the whatever you have to be the change. If you want the world to change, you have to be the change that you have to be the power that drives that change. Thank you. How important it is to raise that consciousness, Kathy. Yeah, I just want to add to that. And it's also important to like be consistent. Like sometimes I feel like people get nervous or or forget and they, you know, give in to stereotypes or give in to stereotyping other people. We have to be consistent. We have to be on the same page um, all the time. And otherwise you're just going to backtrack a lot of work that's been done. Um, so we just need to be consistent. I would also say like look to the fam look to the people who you who you trust the most. Like, you know, like I trust my family the most. Like I'm a married man. I know that my I have eight sisters, but my my wife also now has eight advocates beyond just being a sister. So if I mess up, that's eight women that are gonna beat me up. So, you know, just the, like hold yourself accountable. Like be honest with yourself, be honest with who you are. Don't allow yourself to be easily swayed by whether it's media, politics, or anything like that. Like to be secure in your in your own skin. Thank you. Wow, that accountability and that checking yourself and consistency, as well as just raising the issue uh, and really moving ourselves forward. I want to be mindful of time. We have some questions that have come through the chat. And uh, you know, we've talked a bit about what we can do to empower our children. Um, we want, we've asked, we've been asked questions about um, how do you navigate concerns uh, about being yet another Asian person in your environment. Um, and then there's another question of uh, what message do you have for our white audience? And so we've got a number here. You can feel free to choose. Um, here's the thing, uh, and, and this is regarding academia. Um, and and it's, you know, I'm, I'm here in Irvine um, where there's, you know, an overrepresentation of Asian Americans, especially in the schools. And, um, you know, so for for the longest time, you know, 
uh, you know, my son didn't really have that much of a concept of white privilege because he didn't really see it and experience it until he left Irvine <laughs> and left the state. <laughs> um, and then you, you really see it manifest. But, you know, the I would say regarding, um, you know, the overrepresentation of uh, Asians in an academic setting, keep in mind that that is simple, that is a bubble. And that is a microcosm of what actual society is like. And so you look at the overrepresent and, and don't feel bad about it. I think it's important, lean into it, embrace it. There's nothing wrong with it because the reality is that is not the real the, the reality of life in this country. The reality of life in this country is that we're still overly underrepresented. So when you talk about the imbalance of Asians in an academic setting, you'll see that it's not the same when you get higher up and what I mentioned before, the bamboo ceiling, and you'll see how ironic it is or how crazy it is that we're overrepresented in one area, but then deeply under overrepresented in one area, but highly underrepresented. Still in this country, we make up only 1.5% of executives in Fortune 500 uh, companies. So we are highly underrepresented. And I think you make a very great point with that. Uh, Malo or Kathy, do you wanna add anything? Okay. I was gonna go ahead and answer the, uh, like, what message do we have for the white audience? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, this is just my personal opinion. Um, I don't like to use, I don't like to refer to people based off of color. Um, uh, um, yeah, I don't like to like brown, black, white, because I feel like, like I know the uh, people who, who are unfamiliar with the API community or who are like typically seen as outsiders beyond, you know, I, I think white is what is considered the general, like the typical norm for this country. Um, but you have a history yourself, like beyond just the American history. Like uh, uh, most of, I would pretty much say 90% of our ancestors derived from somewhere else. And I, uh, that's just not, that's not just my opinion. I think that's, that's educated, that's history. Um, get to know where you came from. Um, if, if you're having a struggle, if you're struggling with identifying with what we are speaking about, um, I know people from Ireland, had a hell of a time when they were coming through Ellis Island, like and being discriminated uh, discriminated against by their own people, by their uh, by their own Irish fellow Irishmen or Irish women or whatever you want, however you want to refer to it as. Um, um, my 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 wife, she's uh, Czech, Irish, Austrian, and Norwegian. That is just a mixing pot of. But you know what? On, on a driver's license, when you go to apply for a driver's license, they don't have any of that represented. They have white. So I would say get to know where you came from, ask the questions, you know, leave nothing, no stone unturned, leave no question unasked when it comes to talking to your family or where you where you your your family originated from. Cause I feel like we have a lot more things in common than you think as far as dealing with whether it be oppression, whether it be discrimination, bigotry, um, uh, just overall hate, like, and I, I'm not saying that hate is the only thing that connects us. There's also great things about where we come from, uh, whether it be our religion or whether it be our ancestry and successes or having to overcome certain obstacles, like be willing to ask the uncomfortable questions and get to know yourself farther than uh, beyond than just the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the label of being white, brown, black, or yellow or orange, whatever it may be. Thank you. Um, Kathy, and I know Tammy, you mentioned that you might have to depart because you have another meeting. I do. I have a city council meeting. Oh gosh. Okay. Uh, you know, but I Kathy, did see there's a question. There is a question. Yeah. And um, can it can you just respond briefly and then we can wrap up here? And I know you have to go, but we'll stay on a little bit. Yeah, so uh, can you repeat the question so the audience? Yes, I can. So there's a question for Tammy and it says, reflecting on your climb towards your position on city council, what are some issues you faced as an APISA member and how did you overcome them? Do you feel like they're still prevalent? Okay, 
Um, thank you for the question. It's really important, I think, for elected. Uh, I think one of the things that we've seen in elected, other people who are also in elected office uh, who um, lean into their identity, we don't hide away from it. I am proud, I am deeply proud to be Asian American and I am deeply proud to be Korean American. Um, and I wear that on my sleeve and I don't shy away from that at all. I don't need to, I can embrace it, I can lean into it and I want to lean into it. But with that said, that leaves you vulnerable for those uh, who uh, are, are openly Asian <laughs> <laughs> is is uh, you know being treated as a perpetual foreigner um where you have people come to your city council meetings or in public forums um basically expressing that you need to be grateful um being an american uh as a candidate uh being told you know go back to china go back to north korea uh yes people <laughs> it does happen and so as shocking as that may seem um, but, um, you know, how do you overcome it? it? It's, it's just simply being confident in who you are and not, I, I don't need to be less quote unquote, less Asian, which means I'm not going to shy away from making sure that our community is represented to making sure that we have the services, the tools, the resources that our community needs in order to thrive and be successful. I'm never going to shy away from that. And I'm never going to hide from that, or I'm never going to not talk about it. Um, I'm going to make sure that we are fully represented at all costs. And, uh, and and I think a lot of uh, Asian American electeds who want to quote unquote blend in, make sure that they don't over communicate the need for representation. I don't do that. Um, and that's the only thing that I can do to be true to myself. Um, and, you know, I look at, I look at elected officials, I look at Congresswoman Judy Chu, like she never backs away from being who she is as an Asian American and she will go all over the country or Grace Meng in New York. Uh, they will go all over the place. And that's what I plan to do. I plan, we don't have very many of us. And so those who are elected, we can't hide away from being who we are. And I, I know I have a greater responsibility than just representing uh, the residents of Irvine, but as an Asian American woman, as a Korean American elected, I, I I need to to be a voice for a community wherever they are or wherever we are. Um, and I I have letters from people in Texas and people in other states thanking me for uh, being a firm advocate for a community, uh, making sure that I'm not. Because the moment I'm treated as a perpetual foreigner, you are treated as a perpetual foreigner. All right, gosh. <laughs> this is beyond what we could have expected for today's Titan Table Talk. And I know that you do have to depart. And so I just want to very formally thank you. Thank you for your time, uh, Kathy and uh, Molo, if we could stay on. Uh, but if you do have to depart, we thank you again for for your graciousness and your contributions. Thank you. I'm so sad to leave, but I have to go. Yes, us too. <laughs> Kathy, I know I'm supposed to wrap up um, right now, but do you have anything that you wanted to say before we part today? Um, you know, just really quickly, just to respond to the, the question, um, you know, what message do you want to have for the audience um, that are not from the piece of community? Just want to say, you know, what's important is your attitude. If you're open to learning, educating yourself, it really makes a difference. It's okay to mess up and say the wrong thing, but, you know, just come in with good intentions. That's really what I wanted to say um, and help amplify our voices. You know, we're not good at speaking up for ourselves. So be an ally, share our, our content, even if it's just on social media, just share it help us raise awareness. That's all I want to say. <laughs> thank you. And thank you so much. Oh, Malo, do you want to add anything before I wrap up? 
Oh no! Like just echoing what Kathy said. Like you know, yeah, we're we're we all live, breathe, we breathe the same air, we eat the same food. Well, some of us eat the same food. I eat a lot of food, but um, yeah, we're all the we're all the same people. Like you know, we like don't be afraid to make. Oh wait, can you unmute? Don't be afraid to say the wrong thing. Like what Kathy, what Kathy said. Like say it, and if you make a mistake, own it. And move on from it. The only way we learn is by making mistakes. So don't be afraid to make mistakes. Well, I just really want to thank both of you and Tammy Kim and all of our folks in our DIE program, as well as President Virgie. This has been such a tremendous Titan Table Talk. You've really grappled with some very important themes. I, we've only touched the surface, really, and I feel like we could go on for several hours, and I have a feeling that participants in our audience feel the same way. I know I feel incredibly inspired, particularly with the conversations that we've had about people and knowing where we've come from, knowing that we have privileges, honoring our heritage, honoring our history, but also thinking about where we are going in our future. People in our audience have had that same question. I hope we've been able to answer some of them. And also, I hope that with this Titan Table Talk, you will be inspired to consider what our panelists have said in your own ways with one small step, becoming, becoming conscious of yourself, becoming conscious of your privileges, uh, becoming conscious of what you can do to instigate change in some small way or perhaps a larger way with your education, and then even taking it a step further in whatever spheres you are in, what kind of impact you can make. And what I will always encourage coming out of Asian American studies is to always, always remember our communities. Remember that we are not alone. Remember that we are not only the APISA community, we are part of a larger society, and that it's so important that we have solidarity with our many communities and allies who want to uplift us all. Because of course, when, um, when one of us rises, all of us rises. And on that note, I would like to, again, thank you for your time. And I did see one question from somebody who asked a question about Mauna Kea. Um, I hope that our, um, our tech folks can be able to print this in the chat. Mauna Kea is a um, volcano and, uh, and mountain and sacred space in, uh, on the big island of Hawaii. And the issue was that um, there were folks who wanted to build a 30 meter telescope on the um, summit of Mauna Kea when there are already telescopes on there. This would be a huge imprint, a huge impact on the land. And um, people just said, no, we, we, can, we have to stop this. We cannot continue uh, people not viewing this land as sacred and not viewing this land in the way that we view this land, which is part of our heart, part of our aina, the, uh, the land that feeds us. So I hope I've um, explained that correctly, Malo. That was beautiful. Thank you. Of course, of course. And um, thank you all again. And I will turn it back over to um, Dr. Vasquez. Right. Thank you so much, Professor Yi. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. That was a, a rich dialogue, and I, I'm so excited that that you all joined us here um, this morning and transitioning to this afternoon. I want to thank all of the audience and participants in the webinar um, for attending um, today's talk on APISA empowerment. Um, I should say just again, special thanks to our moderator, Dr. Jennifer Yi, for leading this dialogue and her opening remarks. We should also thank Vice Mayor Kim, Kathy, and Malo for sharing their stories and experiences with us today. And of course, thank you to President Virgie and all of the staff titans at the Alumni Engagement Office, Government and Community Relations, and the President's Office. A special shout out too to all of the staff and behind the scenes people in the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Programs Office um, who work with me. We've been, we've been so lucky to work on this event. This is the last one for this year. So and we've had a successful program with Titan Table Talks, and it's been very exciting. Um, and finally, you will receive an email for from the office um, requesting feedback and a program assessment. And we'd appreciate it if everybody is able to take a couple minutes to fill that out for us and send it back. Thanks for being part of our conversation, and we hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day. I think Professor Yee has something to say. Oh. Hello. Can I just do a quick shout out? Yeah, of course. Yes. Okay. And is it okay if I share my screen? Um, I believe so. Yeah, it should work. Okay. 
I want to do a quick shout out because there is a show that is opening tomorrow night called Visible, and it's in our Pollock Library South. The curators and producers are Nicole Yang and Susan Shimazu. And if you are interested in this Apisa Titan Table Talk, you will certainly be interested in this amazing um, uh, presentation and art show. Uh, it's it's multi um, it's multi. Uh, media and and I really want to highly encourage folks to come out for the reception tomorrow night from 5 to 8 p.m. and also uh, for just going to see this exhibit which is truly truly remarkable. Awesome thanks Jen appreciate it. All right everybody signing off have a great afternoon take care.